Chapter 15, A Spiritual Curveball. As it turned out, Mr. Jesse was way more popular dead than alive. Lavender, Dale, and me showed up for his service early, only to find the church parking lot packed. People streamed toward the glistening white church in busy crooked lines like ants heading for a sugar cube. The church's window arched like praying hands and a graveyard meandered to the creek. Lavender adjusted his blue tie in his truck's rear room mirror as Dale peered in the side mirror and raked his fingers through his hair. That tie looks good with what's left of your black eye, Lavender, I said. Thanks, Mo. You look pretty, too. I smoothed my dress, black, with pockets in the skirt, and ignored Attila Celeste, who nudged open the door of her mother's white Cadillac and looked our way. Hey, Dale, she said, drawing out the words, you look nice. It was true. Dale had selected his outlaw funeral ensemble, black pants, black shirt, black flip-flops, black tie. She swung her legs out of the car like her knees and ankles were glued together and pushed her blonde hair back. Dale veered toward her like a compass needle toward a magnetic north and grabbed her door. Aren't you sweet, she said. Sorry you couldn't come to my party last night. Me too, he said. She invited him and he didn't tell me. My stomach rolled like a dead carp. She smiled. And Dale, I'm sorry about before. Before? Like when she tried to scam me out of my life savings and scarred, scared Dale half to death? Like before she he was the most famous kid in Tupelo Landing? Dale blushed. That's okay. This is the church me and Mama go to, he told her like she didn't know. Mama plays piano and I'm singing today. I hope you enjoy it. She dropped her honey pie expression. I don't see how you stand up there and do that, she said, her voice going frank. It's so hard. He rocked on his toes. Singing is like racing, he said. You get as ready as you can, step up to the starting line, and let it roll until you get the checkered flag. Until his mother minced toward them. Straighten your skirt, Anna, she said, looking switchblades at Dale. She led Attila away, and Dale stumbled toward us like a sleepwalker. I punched his arm. Hey, he went, rubbing his arm. What was that for? There was no point in explaining. Are you really singing today, I asked. He nodded, looking pleased. As far as I know, this is the first time an alleged suspect has soloed at a funeral of the dearly departed. Besides, Mama didn't have time to get anybody else, he added, as the big-haired twins rolled by in a red mustang lavender waved as they swerved away from him he shoved his hand in his pocket poor lavender first direct car now this they probably didn't recognize you i lied i'm pretty sure they can't drive and think at the same time he gave me a half-hearted wink and then looked at dale i still can't believe mom let you ride out of mr jesse's hand right ride out of mr jesse in, in handcuffs he said shaking his head Dale's got a bodyguard. That's why, I said. Yeah, Dale said. I got some short guy that sweats a lot. Most spotted him behind an azalea. We call him plain clothes Phil. A bodyguard? You're a regular celebrity. No wonder the girls are after you. I envy you, little brother, Lavender said, watching the twins link arms with Tink Williams and stroll down toward the church. I couldn't get a date right now if my life depended on it. Yes, you could, I said. I'll go out with you in just seven more years. He smiled. Thanks. Hey, I better go talk to Sam, see what's going on with the car, he said. I'll see you two after the service. As he threaded his way through the crowd, Skeeter and Sal drifted by. Mr. Jesse's friend and her hubby just pulled up, Skeeter said, nodding at a dark sedan. Good work, I said, pretending not to watch as a dumpy woman in a flower dress climbed out of the car. Thanks. Dale and I entered the church to find most of the pews full. Miss Rose sat on the piano playing old hymns. Mama looks like an angel, Dale whispered. She sounded like one too, playing prayers for Mr. Jesse. We slid into the front pew beside Miss Lana. The huge mirror behind the patio gave me a very, gave me a view of everyone behind me. The whole town and then some. My eyes lingered on the strangers as I performed my upstream mother scan. No one looked like me. 
I scanned a second time, wishing the colonel would stroll in wearing his dress uniform, his hat tucked beneath his arm. What would he... Why would he stay away now? Why didn't he call? The murderer has to be here, Dale whispered. Star thinks so too, I said. Star, dressed in an iron gray suit, crisp white shirt, and black tie, sat on the very last row, Miss Retzel by his side. We wrestled to silence, and Reverend Thompson strode to the pulpit, black robe billowing. I slipped my pad from my pocket as he prayed. <laughs> Amen, he said. Miss Lana took the pulpit, looking stately and black. She stood strong and sad as she waited for our eyes to find hers. Jesse Tatum was our neighbor, she said. He shared his life with us. He shared his meals with us. He left without saying goodbye. Then came the spiritual curveball. This is our chance to say goodbye and to tell each other what we learned from Jesse, she said. The good book says, a child shall lead us, so we'll start with Mo. What? When Miss Lana told me to think about what I learned from Mr. Jesse, I thought it was just something people said, like, walk facing traffic or don't put your elbows on the table. She smiled benevolently. Say whatever's in your heart, sugar. Sometimes I could kill Miss Lana, but then who would I have? I faced the congregation. Lavender sat on the back pew. Attila sat to my left. Mr. Jesse's girlfriend to my right. Grandmother Miss Lacey Thornton shared a pew with Skeeter and Salamander. A gaggle of strangers, including plainclothes Phil, crowded the door. I'm Mo, Mo LeBeau of Desperado Detectives. I was used to Mr. Jesse, and I miss him, I said. I'm sorry he's dead, but I'm glad I f found the murder weapon. Nice, Dale whispered. One thing I learned from him was, even if you're stingy, tip good. Finally, I'd like to say, if you are the murderer, I said, looking around the church, desperado detectives will hunt you down like the dog you are. Thank you. Straight from the heart, Ms. Lana said. Now, you may call on somebody. Not me, Dell whispered. Pick a suspect. A suspect. Brilliant. The double chin lady with the jealous husband, I said, pointing to Mr. Jesse's girlfriend. I winked at Lavender and sat down. Me? She sputtered. The crowd turned. I barely knew Jesse Tatum, and my husband doesn't have a jealous bone in his body, she said. We were at a shag contest in Myrtle Beach the day Jesse died. Anything else you heard is a lie. I scribbled on a notepad. Ask Skeeter to check her alibi. She pointed it at Anna Celeste, who rose smoothly, her blue sundress. Mr. Jesse taught me to dress neatly because people talk. Bless his heart. Sally Amanda? Sal stood, her face framed by a halo of tar tight curls. I hardly knew him. I call on Dale, she said, blushing. He gulped. Me? Sorry, Dale, she said. I forget you might be the murderer. She looked at Miss Lana. May I have a do-over? I call on Thess. Thess popped to his feet, his round face red and glistening. He loosened his bow tie. Everybody thinks Mr. Jesse was cheap, he said, but he wasn't. Every Saturday night, he slid a hundred dollars under the church door. He did it for eleven years. That's that I know of, even in hazardous weather. The church erupted like a hive of startled bees. I looked in the mirror to see Joe Starr lean forward, his hand on the pew before him to study the crowd. What? Mayor Little cried. Jesse Tatum made donations? It's true, Thess said. I saw him. Thank you, Thess, Reverend Thompson cried, jumping to his feet and throwing his arms open. Let us pray, he boomed over the hubbub. I looked in the mirror. Everybody in the room bowed their heads. Everybody except me and Joe Starr. At prayer's end, Dale stole to the, strolled to the piano, closed his eyes, and began to sing. Amazing grace is right. What Dale, when Dale sings, even the wind stops to listen. As his last crystal sound died away, the congregation rose and headed for the door, murmuring like doves. I, on the other hand, trailed Thess. As the choir loft, a hand snaked out of the shadows. Psst, Deputy Marla hissed. Over here. Hey, Deputy, I said, watching Star slip inside Reverend Thompson's office. Her grip was cold against my skin. I twisted my arm against her thumb, the way Mr. Lee taught me, and pulled away. You scared me, 
Sorry, she smiled as Star closed the door behind him. The pattern of her close-fitting summer suit blended with the diamond shadows of the choir loft's small windows. She's good at surveillance, I thought. Good at hiding. Look, I had a feeling you wanted to tell me something yesterday at Priscilla's, she said. I'm sorry I had to rush off, but my work is like that. Is everything okay with you? Kids don't usually ask about cold cases, even if they are detectives. Don't tell her, a voice inside me whispered. But why not? Everybody in town knows about me. I was thinking about my upstream mother, I said. She went missing 11 years ago, and I've been tracking her ever since. That's how I got into the detective business. So that's your cold case, she said. Your mother? Her eyes went soft. That's tough. She studied me a moment. I'm sorry, Mo. We really don't handle cold cases, but... I shrugged. That's okay. I got it covered. You didn't let me finish, she said. We don't handle cold cases, but the, if there's ever a specific piece of information I can help you with, or if you ever need a sounding board, come see me. I'll do what I can. As a professional courtesy. Then she grinned and winked. Just don't tell my boss, she whispered. Professional courtesy? For me? Thanks, I said. She faded into the shadows and I headed for Reverend Thompson's office. Good afternoon, I said, pushing the door open. Sorry, I'm late. Before Star could react, Reverend Thompson waved me in. Come in, Mo. We're just answering some questions about Detective Star. For Detective Star. About Mr. Jesse's contributions, Seth added. Thanks, Reverend, I said, taking my place beside my fellow detective. Star cleared his throat. You say all of Jesse's contributions were in cash? Hundred dollar bills, Reverend Thompson said. I didn't know who they were from until recently, and I never tried to find out. The first one came with a note. I opened my clue pad. A note? Do you still have it? Star snapped his pen and glared at me. He looked sharp in a suit, starched, pressed, and shined. Some people look like they were born on a clothes hanger. Not me. I look more like I was born in a dryer. Mo, Star said. You can stand in on my interview, but be quiet. Otherwise, I'll clear the room. Got it? I nodded. Do you still have Jesse Tatum's note, he asked the reverend. I rolled my eyes. That was my question. No, Reverend Thompson said, but I can tell you what it said. Keep this money quiet or the rest goes to the Episcopalians. Episcopalians, I wrote. Did that strike you as odd, Jesse Tatum leaving money here? Yes, Jevi Jesse never attended a church, even as a visitor. Not even when there was free food, thus added. But grace happens, the reverend said. Jesse could have been a believer but not a churchgoer, or he could have felt guilty about something and felt better sliding a little just-in-case money under the door. Tell me about seeing him for the first time, Thess, Star said. Thess glanced at his father, who nodded. It was an accident. My cat Spitz got out again, and I was looking for him, as usual. And you saw Jesse Tatum? I saw him sneak up in the moonlight and slide a white envelope under the door. After that, I stalked out staked out the door for a couple weeks. It was him, all right. What did you do with the money? Star asked the Reverend Thompson. The Reverend smiled. First, I thanked God for it. Then I put it in the bank. We bought paint for the sanctuary, updated the baptistry, mended the roof. You're welcome to look at our books. That won't be necessary. How much money are we talking about total? Reverend Thompson reached for a calculator, punched in some numbers, and whistled. Let's say, let's say 11 years, roughly 57 thousand two hundred dollars i gasped where did mr jesse get that kind of money joe star snapped his pad shut good question he said where indeed that night i grabbed my pen and notebook dear upstream mother death makes you think everybody has a way of believing the colonel says God took Sunday off, so he does too. He walks in the woods or lies on his bunk. He says if God needs him, he knows where to find him. Miss Lana believes in treating people right. She mostly hits church festivi festivities, Easter when she wears a new hat, and Christmas Eve to cry when Dale sings Silent Night. Dale goes to church because Miss Rose likes him too. I sometimes go to keep him company and hear stories of the original Moses. Miss Rose plays the piano. I sit with Dale and grandmother Miss Lacey Thornton, whose alto runs true as a rusty fence. My voice is like a turkey gobble crammed in a corset, but nobody's told me to stop singing, and I ain't shy. Lavender, who I will one day marry, believes in NASCAR Zen, which I suspect he made up. The car is the body, he said. The driver is awareness zipping around in and out of traffic. 
and the Zen is the everything of it. Track, car, self, other drivers. You focus without thinking to win, he says. You feel it. <coughs> it's one reason I love racing. What do you believe? Please let me know. If you're wondering about me, like Miss Lana, I believe in treating people good. And like the Colonel, I think God can find me. Love, Mo. P.S. The Colonel still hasn't called and today made three days. Miss Lana says not to worry that she will handle it. I'm worried anyway. Where is he? Why would he leave us when there's a killer on the prowl? He has to have a good reason, but what reason tempts, trumps keeping us safe? If you, if you see him, please ask him to come home. And that's the end of chapter 15.